Okay, thank you very much. So, yes, um, I'm going to talk to you today about stroke. Um, it's the leading cause of disability in the United States. Somebody's having a stroke every 40 seconds. It's about 800,000 people a year in the U.S. Um, and at the current time, we don't really have um, a cure for the disability, mainly weakness down one side of your body after stroke. Um, and I'm going to show you some new data on how maybe we can do something about this problem. Um, these are 10 people who've all had strokes. These are MRI images. Um, they're a particular kind of MRI that can actually detect the stroke within minutes of it happening. And for you, you do, all you need to know is that the intense white bright bit on those brain scans is the stroke. And in all 10 of these patients, they are completely paralyzed down one side. And then the question is, who is going to get better? Why don't they get better? And can we make them get better, even though we predicted that they would not? Now, the problem is that after you have a stroke like that, um, you go into a hospital. And hospitals have become very luxurious. And you can sit in a room alone and, and watch the weather channel, like this patient here. Um, the problem is that in the first couple of weeks after a stroke, you spend about 60% of your time alone, and only about 15% of the time moving. And it, as I'm going to show you, this is not the best kind of environment to try and get your brain rewired after the injury. And by the way, sort of in the spirit of the day, this drawing here was done by a MICA graduate who's a full-time animation artist in our lab now called Cat. And one of the themes that I hope you'll take away from us today, and I'll be repeating, is that you really need to do something creative by bringing artists and scientists together. So this is just a tiny bit of science and math, don't panic. Um, all this is basically saying is that after brain injury, there seems to be a fairly predictable rule of recovery, which we call proportional recovery. And the idea is, for most patients, you can get about 70% back of your maximal potential recovery. But unfortunately, there's a subset of patients, particularly the ones who are severely paralyzed, who don't follow this rule. So the reason why it's interesting to have this rule is it means there is some kind of process going on in the brain which is self-repairing, and we need to somehow piggyback on that process and make it even better. And for those patients who don't even follow this process, we have even more work to do. And then this is a functional imaging scan where we were able to show that this rule of recovery that seems to be going on endogenously in the brain after injury can be captured by brain imaging, suggesting once again that there's something systematic about it and that we could potentially exploit it. So one of the things that we did at Hopkins and at other universities in Europe um, up in New York was to sort of take a closer look at this process of recovery after brain injury to get some mechanistic insight into it and then hopefully again be able to use what we've learned to come up with better treatments. And essentially what this study did was track patients within a couple of weeks of their stroke over a whole year and then throw the kitchen sink at them in terms of available technologies to sort of see what's going on. These included doing non-invasive brain stimulation, functional imaging, structural imaging, behavioral analysis, and motion capture. Just to sort of get a sense of what the natural history of this process is. And what I'm going to show you now is just a tiny piece of the data we gathered to, to sort of reinforce the idea um, that we don't have that much time to work in to try and piggyback on this repair process. So one of the things we do is we have a kind of, in, in the lab um, at BLAM, at Brain Learning and Animation and Movement Lab, um, we um, have a setup where you sit at a chair and you have your arm on an air sled and you can make out and back arm movements rather like in um, that air hockey kind of thing. The reason we do this is that you can't make these movements unless you're, you have normal motor control. In other words, you're stuck in this chair, your arm's like this, and you have to make these straight movements like you see there on the right. And the point is that there's no way that you can cheat at this. In other words, you can't move your trunk back and forth. There's no way to make these nice straight movements unless you can coordinate your elbow and shoulder together. So it's basically our basic test of the quality of your ability to control your arm with your brain. Okay? And we take this very much for granted. And any of you who put in this apparatus would look just like you can see those trajectories um, on the right. 
Now, there's a patient after a stroke, a mild to moderate stroke. So they're trying to do what the healthy subject is doing, but they can't. And the question is, is can we get from the stroke level of motor control over to the healthy side? Now, what happens when you go for rehabilitation after brain injury in 2015 is there's not an attempt to try and make your movements normal again, to actually repair the brain. We just have to help you cope with what you have left. So if you're that bad, for example, and that's your dominant arm, you perhaps will have to start learning how to use a fork and to write with your other arm. Okay? So the idea is, let's get you back into the world and deal with what you have left. But we feel that that's a little bit pessimistic, and what we really need to be trying to do is to actually truly normalize your movements again. All right. Now, if you take those trajectories that I showed you, and you try and quantify them, and then you plot how good and how close those trajectories get to the normal ones, you can get a plot like you see up here. And suffice to say, these are just two different measures on the y-axis. Um, and all I want you to see is that you improve. You go down over the first five weeks, and then you hit flatline. All right? And just for you to see that that's not some sort of true bottom, you can see healthy subjects in the green line underneath. That's where you could get to in an age-matched control. But you see the patients do well for the first month, and then they do no better. Okay? Now, that's concerning. It means that for some reason, whatever this endogenous repair process is, it's over in a month. All right. And as I told you, in the first two weeks after stroke, you spend most of your time alone and most of your time not moving. So I would make the point that we have this window and we're not using it. All right. So let's try another way of learning more about this kind of window by looking at animal models. So in parallel with the human work that we're doing, um, we're also looking at mouse models of stroke. And I'm going to just show you a little bit about mouse stroke. And I would say that in 2015, if you do have a stroke, you'll be better off if you're a mouse. <laughs> and this is just a slide to show that, in fact, rats and mice, to a lesser degree, are remarkably dexterous and can be used as a model of motor control. And I'll show you this. This is a mouse. Now, mice don't really have table manners. They would prefer just to pick up their food like that. Okay? But you can train them over time to do what we call prehension. And prehension is the term used for reach and then grasp. So I'll just show you this. This is a mouse at the beginning of training. This is a normal mouse. This has not had a stroke. Look at that. Right? I bet you didn't know that mice had little hands like that. Okay, but now that you've all been warmed by the mouse, we'll now uh, give it a stroke. <laughs> all right? Um, so this is a mouse brain, and what you can do is you can actually block an artery over its cortical surface, like you can see there on the right, and, and an area of the brain dies, it has a stroke. It's deprived of blood and oxygen, and it dies. And this is a cross-section, and we're going to zoom in on it, and there's the stroke. Okay, so we've given it a stroke in its motor cortex, which is the part of the brain that controls its contralateral reaching limb. Okay, so you take a mouse, and as I showed you in that video, you train it to reach four pellet, and it can get up to 60% efficacy, meaning that on its first reach, 60% of the time, it successfully nabs that food pellet. So you get it up to about that level of performance. You never get all the way up to 100% because they're not really that good at this kind of behavior. And you know, we want to do experiments in a you know, realistic time frame. So then you give it a stroke like I just showed you. And of course, its performance plummets. This is group data. And then you start giving it rehabilitation. And in this case, what you mean is you try and train it again on the same task. And what you can see is that you can spend weeks doing it, and you can never get back to where you were before. It gets up a little bit, okay, but doesn't do very well. And we waited a week, okay, so we put it back in its cage, and then we started to rehabilitate it after a delay. This is not that unlike what happens to you if you've had a stroke. You go to an acute stroke unit where I work m much of the time, and uh, you have to get the medical condition stabilized, and then you go to rehabilitation. Okay. But what if you don't wait a week? What if you start right away? So we give them a stroke. And we go within a day, back to normal. 
So one day, somehow for the same amount of training, you can get a lot more back than if you wait. Right. Fairly compelling. Now, if it's true that there's something special about what strokes do that make the brain uniquely plastic, and we feel like, in a sense, what happens after brain injury is you briefly go back to the kind of plasticity you see early in development, then we should be able to prove that, paradoxically, by, in fact, making somebody better from their stroke by giving them another one. Now, as you can imagine, we're not going to be doing this at Johns Hopkins Hospital, but we're doing it um, <laughs> is a proof of principle that there's something special in the stroke environment that can actually aid recovery. Okay? And this is exactly what we can show you here. So you, again, you train the mice up, you give them a stroke, you wait a week, you can't get them up to that level before, and then you say, let's give them another stroke right next door to where we gave the original one, and, it makes, and you'll notice that they get worse, and then they go all the way back to normal. Yeah. So, obviously, there's something special about the period triggered by the ischemia that we need to exploit, and I think this is fairly self-explanatory. The question, obviously, at this point, is how do we do this without giving people another stroke? Right. <laughs> so, just to summarize, and you can read about this from our website, and most importantly, when it comes to our website, you need to follow us on Twitter, <laughs> um, is that there seems to be, unlike in the normal brain and unlike in the chronic brain, when it may be a little too late, a period very early after stroke where you have damage, but you've also got this hyperplasticity that we may be able to do something with. All right? So, one idea is to try drugs. Now, one potential one is Prozac, known as fluoxetine, uh, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which has been shown to have some effect on brain plasticity. Um, I don't have enough time to go into details, but suffice to say that we thought we'd give Prozac a go um, in our mice. I should point out that the effect it seems to be having does not relate to its effect on mood. Um, and you can see here that even though we are waited a week, now when you gave them the drug right after their stroke and then waited that week that beforehand didn't seem, which led to a reduced responsivity to training, now you can get yourself back up to normal. Okay, so, un so that would be good news. It means there are ways other than inducing another stroke where you can perhaps pr prolong and maintain this increased responsivity to training. So, what else? Well, if you look in the animal literature, unlike that hospital room with the patient watching the Weather Channel alone, moving 15% of the time, if you want to sort of induce improved recovery from brain injury in rodents, the way to do it is actually to put them in enriched environments. In other words, you put them in with their friends, you give them toys, you give them multi-levels, you basically put them in this kind of fairground-like environment. And it's interesting that this kind of enriched environment that leads to motivation, reward, interaction, enjoyment, fun, um, everything that we try and drain out of the hospital experience as quickly as possible, um, they actually recover despite not receiving task-specific training. So in other words, you can see there that we've got the task I showed you on the right, then a sort of spinning wheel in the middle, and then just a general fun environment on the left. Okay. And Suffice to say that these kinds of environments that foster um, sort of enjoyment and play and exploration seem to actually make recovery better. So the question we're going to finish with is how do we turn that hospital room more like an enriched rat cage? Um, sort of translational medicine in the opposite direction, right? So. The idea is, is that you can create a kind of gaming, virtual reality, robotic environment in the hospital room, ultimately, um, and, God forbid, make it fun to be sick. <laughs> right? If you're a child, you, in, in pediatric hospitals, if you're lucky, some fairly scary clown might walk into your room. But if you're an adult, it's supposed to be bleak and austere and feel uh, lonely. And we have to do something about that, seriously. Right. 
So, I'm going to now tell you about a trial we're doing, which is just about to begin, where we're going to use exoskeletal robotics plus gaming plus brain stimulation to try and pounce on this period early after and create an adult version of an enriched environment. Um, in addition to that exoskeleton that I showed you, we're also now working on 3D printed soft robotic hands to try and do the equivalent for your hand after stroke. And the idea is that you could actually have this cool robotic hand on, in bed, and self-train. Uh, so that's another direction we're going in. So I'm going to show you the interface that patients um, are now seeing. Um, and while they are in this exoskeletal robotic arm. Um, and I, we've run about 10 patients, and I can tell you the kind of childlike delight and playfulness that it triggers is really astonishing even to me. Um, so we're very hopeful that we'll actually bring fun and play back into the brain injury environment. So let me just show you if we, what people actually get to see in this trial. Hope the sound is up. And you are the dolphin, you are controlling it. This is the robot. So this is the easy level where you have to get fish and eat them. And the patients love it. And then it gets hard. This is when it becomes a shark battle. This happens in the oceans. Okay, so... And I, and, and I have to tell you, the patients absolutely do seem to love playing this, but of course, we can make no scientific claims as of yet as to its efficacy and whether it will work as an enriched environment. Let me please point that out, that this trial is about to start and these are pilot data. But I have to say that even if, and this is the provocative thing, that this did not repair you, for example, if you were outside the window, the ability to be in a controlling environment again is unbelievably pleasurable once you've lost movement. And you could also dive into the ocean with a loved one and both of you go in, okay? It would be like going for a walk in the park without leaving the hospital room. Um, now, I want to finish just by saying that, and I think this speaks to the other talks that you've heard, which is to do this kind of work is really not about one person. I'm talking about it, but it requires an unbelievably talented group of people from unexpected disciplines to come together to do this. So, for example, the Carter team, and that's the logo, um, and just to tell you the kind of people, this is Omar, Kat, Pramit, and Kevin. Um, Omar did his PhD in computer science. He worked for Disney for a while. He's a computer scientist and programmer. Kat was the micrograduate who did the pictures I showed you before, does all the rendering for these games. Um, as a micrograduate, now a full-time animation artist in a neuroscience lab at Hopkins. I mean, this is sort of unusual. And then Pramit also did computer science at Hopkins and worked at Microsoft as a programmer. And then Kevin has just got his PhD in robotics here at Hopkins. Now these kind of super nerds, <laughs> right, um, are working cheek by jowl with neuroscientists, clinicians, and therapists to do this. And I will say that if we want to move forward in this space of brain injury and many other areas of medicine, you have to bring people together doing things that you may not at first blush think should be in the same room. And what we really need to do is sort of Pixar up the healthcare and scientific space. 
Okay. And so, you know, Omar, Kat, Pramit, and Kevin are working with, you know, teams. This is the Columbia team, for example, and they're neuroscientists, physiatrists, rehab physicians, um, and actually the uh, guy with the least hair on the bottom row, uh, Steve Zyla, is heading up the mouse data. And so, in other words, you can imagine that all these people are working on what seem to be different parts of the same animal. Thank you very much. These are our funders, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much.